Good evening, everyone, and welcome to Social Flight Live. I'm Jeff Simon. We have an amazing show for you this evening. It's Super Guppy Night here on Social Flight Live, and we have Ray Heineman and Dave Elliott here to learn all about this amazing aircraft. Before we get started, just a few things. First of all, we are in the very end of this Fly to Win Challenge on Social Flight. We're giving away a Lightspeed Delta Zulu headset on December 1st. This is the headset that comes with the canary carbon monoxide detection. Uh, it, it has the hearing acuity that allows you to customize the profile for your hearing and possibly for some people hearing loss. It's an amazing headset and you could win it on December 1st. All you need to do is get the free Social Flight mobile app for Apple or Android devices. Get out there and fly. You can even check in at your local airport. You get points at every airport you check in at, and that's how you build points, and it's just a drawing. Even one check-in, you're entered in to win, but if you get on our leaderboard, then you get extra entries into that drawing, so I can't wait to award that. We are always giving away cool things on Social Flight. And of course, Social Flight is where you can find tens of thousands of aviation events and destinations. So many cool things going on there because even in the winter months, we want to keep you flying and support general aviation. Tonight's broadcast is brought to us by U Avionics and their amazing AV30, AV20, their Sky Beacon, Tail Beacon, Tail Beacon X, Sky Sensor, all sorts of different things, whether you need uh, ADS-B equipment or a primary electronic flight instrument. We, uh, this is something we are building in as a key part of the Mustang that's here behind me. If you watch our Mustang build, I'll tell you, it's it got UAVionics equipment on it, and I absolutely love it. So be sure to check that out. Lots of cool things, and thanks to UAVionics for supporting Social Flight and also for supporting General Aviation. Now to tonight's guest. If you love strange, quirky, and amazing planes, then the Super Guppy is for you. At a 25-foot interior diameter, it is NASA's one-of-a-kind wide-body transport aircraft that can haul larger loads than even a C-5 Galaxy. When you think, I mean, with those are the planes that people walk through, and this thing has a bigger cross-section to load things up than even an aircraft like that. It's crazy. We saw this plane uh, at uh, when it landed at uh, Oshkosh this year at Air Venture. It's uh, it's so much fun to check it out, and that is why we are bringing it to you tonight. Tonight's guests are Ray Heineman, Chief of Aircraft Operations and Instructor Pilot of the Super Guppy, and David Elliott, Flight Engineer of the Super Guppy. Ray has over 10,000 flight hours in 65 different aircraft, gliders, and helicopters. In addition to the Super Guppy, his experience includes flying and instructing in the T-38N Talon, the WB-57F High Altitude Research Aircraft, the C-9B Microgravity Research Aircraft, otherwise known as the Vomit Comet, and the Gulfstream 3 and 5 aircraft, plus many, many more things. Uh, prior to NASA, Ray also served 24 years of active and reserve duty with the United States Navy, flying the Grumman A6E Intruder from the deck of the USS America. David Elliott is the lead flight engineer for NASA's Super Guppy at Johnson Space Center. He's worked at NASA since 2010, flying over 1,100 hours on more than 50 missions, carrying oversized space and air, aviation components throughout the United States. And prior to his position at NASA, David served 20 years in the United States Navy as a P-3 Orion flight engineer. I'm thrilled to have them both with us here on the show tonight. We're going to pick their brain and learn what it's like to fly such a unique and fun aircraft. Please help me welcome to Social Flight Live, Ray Heineman and David Elliott. I'm going to bring them both on the line right now. Welcome to the show. How are you both doing? Hey, how's it right. going? Thanks for having us. Um, first of all, thank you so much for joining us. When uh, when the boys and I, when Jake Bennett and I got a chance to check out the Super Guppy at Air Venture 2023, uh, it was just amazing. And we were looking at all the details, and, and it's just it's mind blowing how cool and unique that aircraft is. Uh, so you you certainly have very special jobs. I, I love my job. I smile when I come to work. I love flying the guppy. 
And uh, Air Venture was the first time, that was the first Air Venture I'd ever been to. So it was really a neat experience. Uh, I think Dave might've been his first time too. And we talked to thousands of people about the airplane and told them all about it. And it was just a really fun week. That is, that's so cool. Um, I, I want to, let me start with some some background of how you you got to NASA, how you came to where you are. Let's start with Ray. Um, Tell me a little bit about, obviously, as we said in the beginning, you came out of the Navy, um, but what is it that got you to this kind of really unique section of NASA? Um, I think it was a couple of things. One was education. Uh, the pilots that we hire at the Johnson Space Center are typically engineers uh, by trade or by education. Uh, and then we also look for people with a high performance aircraft background. So flying uh, Navy intruders, that helped me get into the door. Um, I also like to tell people it was kind of the longest interview I'd ever had because I actually interviewed about four years before I got hired. And uh, when I was at that interview, um, I learned that the Navy had just given NASA a C-9, and I was flying C-9s for the Navy at the time. And uh, I didn't get the job, but they kept calling me back to say, hey, can you help us learn how to fly this airplane? And and do maintenance check flights and everything else. And over the four years that I did that, I ended up with a job. So uh, it all worked out for me. So you were flying C-9s in the Navy? I was. After the intruder was retired, I went on and flew King Airs for a while. And then I flew DC-9s and C-9s for the Navy uh, as an active duty reservist. So I, I have to ask, as a, as, as a carrier pilot, I mean, what's it like transitioning off the carrier? Do you, I mean, we, people talk about aiming for the numbers. You must aim for numbers <laughs> in a way that the rest of us can only dream about. Uh, it was always surreal being on the, on the boat. I mean, uh, you would wake up and go on the hangar deck or don't go on the flight deck. And it was just amazing to watch flight operations. Um, but, you know, I, I love flying. And after I left the ship and I started flying other airplanes, it, it's a great memory. I made awesome friends I was still keep in touch with, but uh, you know, it had a shelf life. It was time for me to move on to something else. Do you still retain the same precision that has you like like searching for the three wire? You'll have to ask Dave. I, I, he's the one who judges all my landings, so we'll see. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So Dave, uh, I, I will ask you, 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 you came out of the Navy also, uh, tell me a little right. bit about your background, what got you into aviation and found found your way in the Navy and, and especially flight engineering. Well, uh, let's see, to start with, uh, I guess it was, it was back, the, back in the late 80s, uh, much like a lot of people my age during that time frame, you know, Top Gun had come out and everybody was excited about naval aviation. I thought it was the coolest thing ever. Uh, and I, I just, I hadn't, I wasn't doing a whole lot at the time and I walked into the recruiter and said, I know, you know, I know I'm, I don't got the chops to be a pilot or anything yet, but, you know, can you get me on an aircraft? And they had a, an air crew program that had just uh, started out in 1989, and they put me into it, and I ended up uh, in helicopters first, flying around in the backseat of helicopters uh, in Pensacola, Florida, uh, the initial helicopter training for the Navy. And I almost got out, but I, I actually had uh, two company commanders in boot camp that were P3 flight engineers. And they kept telling me how great it was. And I needed to go do that. And uh, so I, I asked for it. They gave it to me and, and I started doing that. So spent uh, almost, let's say about eight years in Spain, road of Spain, which was a, a very rough tour of duty. Let me tell you, it wasn't, wasn't horrible. I actually believe I, I flew on Ray's C9. He used to fly uh, in and out of, of Rota and Suda Bay. And so, so I uh, spent quite a bit of time in Suda Bay and uh, used to ride the C9 rotator in and out of there. So I, I'm almost positive that we probably crossed paths at one point in the Navy. Uh, but uh, I did my last tour in Jacksonville at the instructing uh, the instructor squadron there and teaching people, you know, new flight engineers coming through. And the P3, of course, was on its on transition on its way out as the P8 was was stood up. And I was looking for for another another profession. I honestly didn't think I would find something using my background. Uh, as flight engineer positions are pretty hard to find nowadays. I was looking at customs. I was looking at NOAA. They both use P3s and and uh, have buddies that are in both of those those positions. But just we happen to have a uh, 
a, a group come through from NASA, from where, where we work, that were getting trained on the engines on the Guppy, which are the same as the P3. Got to talk to them a little bit, and, and I just said, hey, if you're ever looking for somebody, you give me a call, and they did. So I, I was retiring, and they, they just timing worked out, and I, it was lightning struck, and I got lucky. So I, I like to think that uh, I was in the right place at the right time with the right skills, and, and it worked out. So help people understand what a flight engineer does, because I have an immense respect for flight engineers. Sure. You guys, you guys have a grasp of the systems of anything that right. you're in way beyond what a lot of people do when they're when they're working the stick. Right. Sure. Yeah. And, you know, back in the the golden age of of aviation, as I, I like to put it, you know, uh, systems were simpler in a lot of ways, but uh, they were all manual. You know, you had to, to turn a lot of switches, push a lot of buttons, handle everything that, that now computers tend to ha handle uh, more than anything. So it was a, it was a three-man job in a lot of aircraft back in, you know, World War II and, and following that up until, you know, uh, not that long ago, really, they were, they were using flight engineers. So uh, my job is, is essentially to know the systems inside and out, be the be the the systems expert on the plane, and be able to you know diagnose and, and malfunction and suggest the best course of action to the pilots. And, and so that's kind of what it is. We deal with um, you know starting engines, shutting down engines, all the 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 fueling in flight, transferring fuel between tanks, keeping us balanced, uh, electrical systems, hydraulic systems, uh, all of that. So it's it's a busy job. It's a lot of fun. Um, but you know, I, I I've always enjoyed it. So. Wow! And and you mentioned that both of you were basically at the same similar times, uh, mm -hmm. working the uh, I guess what what we all think of when we see astronaut training movies, and and many of the guests on the show that have been astronauts have talked to their time in the quote vomit comet, and so you were in the back during that, David. And yeah, I was. Yeah, must have. Yeah, used, I'd have to. Yeah, uh, used to Oh yeah, yeah, I yeah I was right at home back there. I I used to love it. I had a lot of fun. You know, the the hardest part about that job for me was that I didn't I didn't I couldn't really run wild and you know be doing somersaults back there and everything because I really had to keep my eyes on the uh, all the guests that were flying in the back. They they the first thing it's funny like if you ever uh, you know when you throw a cat and their their arms just kind of shoot out like that that's pretty much everyone's first reaction as soon as they go at a zero g. They immediately start looking for handholds, and and a lot of them will start swimming like they're going to get traction by swimming. And um, you know, people will kick out their legs. They'll kick. They'll kick other people. They'll kick uh, the equipment in the back. The experiments. So you're you're having to you know push them down and hold them you know hold them down and make sure that they understand what they're doing until they get their their legs under them. And once they get the feel out of it, after about the you know two or three of them, then then they know what they're doing and know what to expect. So. <laughs> That that is probably the first time I have heard here on the show someone say, you know, like when you throw a cat. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we toss them on the bed, and they just kind of yeah, yeah. The, the best, the best flights. No, I'll try it after the show and check that out. <laughs> yeah, the, the best flights that we had uh, on the C9 on the on the on the uh, release gravity aircraft was when the pilots would be doing their upgrade training or their proficiency training, and then it was just you know, a couple of us in the back and we got to just, you know, have a ball and we literally take balls up there and throw them at each other, and, you know, do all <laughs> sorts of fun things. All these guys were practicing. And you got paid so. for it. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, it was dangerous. It was dangerous. <laughs> so. You fly with that That's guy. Awesome. So. Well, let's talk about the guppy. Um, I'm going to bring up a, a shot here. So for anyone who's not familiar with it, this is what we are talking about, this adorably beluga looking guppy. Um, tell me about the history of this of this plane. What? Because it, clearly it's it's not something that they made by the dozens. I, I can jump on that one. Um, the actual idea of the guppy came uh, in the early 1960s from a guy named Jack Conroy. And he owned a company that owned a lot of Boeing 376 or 377 airliners. And they were, uh, um, after World War II, it was a derivative of the B-29 that they developed into an airliner. And uh, as the jets came online, they didn't need the 377s. Jack Conroy had bought a bunch of them and had them. And he was looking for a way to make money with them. 
And he found out that when NASA would get a uh, stage, like the third stage of the Saturn V, it was built in California, it would get on a barge, go through the Panama Canal, actually go up the Mississippi River to the Tennessee River, and over to Huntsville in order to test fire the engine. And then once they got that done, they put it back on the barge, went down the Mississippi around Florida, and went to the Kennedy Space Center uh, for launch. And that took anywhere from three to four weeks to do all that. And of course, we were fighting a time constraint of landing a man on the moon before the end of the decade. And so he theorized literally on the back of a napkin in a bar one night, is the, the story I always heard, that you could take these 377s and modify it with a larger fuselage so you could put that third stage in there and actually fly it to Huntsville for testing. And that would only take about six hours. They could get it off. They could actually get the stage to Kennedy Space Center in a fraction of the time that it would take to barge it. So that's where the idea came from. And the uh, Super Guppy turbine that we're flying now is actually the, I want to say the fifth different model. Is that right, Dave? I'm trying to remember, uh, of the airplane. And uh, ours were actually built for Airbus uh, to move fuselages around in Europe from their different factories that they now do the same thing with with the Beluga. But uh, yeah, it's it's been an interesting story through the years of uh, of a large diameter cargo aircraft like the Guppy or Super Guppy. That is, it's it's so cool. I want to show a couple things here so that we can talk through. One is what it really means. We showed the first one of it, and and now the the loading of it is one of the most amazing parts. The idea that this whole thing hinges open. Tell, tell us a little bit about uh, what makes this possible. Yeah, I can, yeah. I can fill you David, in on that. David, want to talk about that because he does yeah. that. That's his job. Yeah. Yeah, we, we spend, uh, you know, most of the job is, is, is really doing this. Uh, there's a lot entailed with this, a lot of work and parts. Um, you know, in any mission, most of it, it goes, most of it is, is planning. Uh, is the engineering work that goes into anything we put in the back has to be properly restrained uh, to make sure that it's not going to you know break loose for one thing or um, start you know uh, hit the side of the fuselage and inside. Uh, so there's a lot of work that goes into that. We have to have a lot of support, obviously. Um, but the the job itself, when we get on the ground, uh, usually takes about 30 minutes to get the nose open. And originally, you know, over in Spain, they did it, they did it with, with one person flying on the airplane and then they had support on the ground. We typically take our, our maintenance folks with us and, and a load master or two uh, to help. But uh, we, we get the airplane uh, stabilized with some struts. You can see there below the, the, uh, the back half of the aircraft. Those will come down and, and stabilize the aircraft first and then we, we'll release all these locks. Some of them are held with, uh, with big torqued on bolts or nuts, and uh, we'll take those off, and then the, the ones up top are all automatic that kind of come out and spread to keep keep uh, keep it uh, held together. So we'll take all that apart, and then there's a, an outrigger that just drives it open. But uh, it, it's an interesting, uh, you know, performance there. It rides on the, the nose wheel, and it has that one hinge. So the one prior actually had two hinges. This one's just got the one. I was amazed. There are a couple of things that uh, the many, but a couple of things really stood out that amazed me when I saw this aircraft in person. One of them is what you just mentioned. That one hinge. That mm -hmm. hinge is not that big. No, it's when, not. When you look at it, it's not like this. Right. You would think it'd be like a hinge that could fill this room I'm in. It's. It's not even remotely that big. You look at it and you're like, really? That's yeah. the. That's the hinge. Um, right. We're and we're very cautious with. Uh, how we park the aircraft. If you if you've ever seen us when when we arrive, you'll you'll usually notice us like kind of hesitate when we taxi. And there'll usually be somebody out front, or we'll let somebody out the door to go and help us uh, get into the right position. We have to position that left wing into the wind so that uh, we're not you know creating a giant sail. We don't want the wind coming anywhere from the right side because uh, it it can be, you know be catastrophic. And in fact, in in France, uh, Airbus actually had that happen to them. They had the wind just for some reason, you know, just had this uh, this uh, fluke 180 degree turn while they had the nose open. 
and it actually pulled the nose right off. So it, it rolled the <laughs> nose on the hinge and the, the tire just kind of went out from underneath it. And, you know, um, they, they ended up fixing it and everything, but, but yeah, we're, <laughs> believe me, that's something we're always very, very cautious about. So. The other thing that stood out to me is that the, all these flight controls, all these cables get unhooked between the front half and the rest and the back half. Yeah, they do. Yeah. What's involved in that process? I mean, we're doing an annual on our bonanza right now and I yeah. can tell you come in there and, and checking flight cable tensions. If you went into that plane right now and disconnected all the cables, I'd be like, oh God, what's this right. thing to, to re right. they it? have the, they they have the blocks. We have blocks on each side that slide into position and there's some steel balls on each of those flight control cables that, that are blocked by those, those blocks we put in place. Uh, so we pin those into place and uh, we've got, we run a checklist and we're very careful to make sure that all those blocks are in place before we start remo uh, removing the, uh, the, or disconnecting the flight control. So, uh, and it, you know, as long as we do it correctly and, and, you know, take our time and, and work through the checklist, it'll keep the tension on both sides of those blocks so that there's no re-rigging necessary. So, so you hold, you hold both sides in place and then right. is it regular turnbuckles basically? It is. Yeah. There's no, there's no hydraulic assist on this airplane. There's no autopilot on this airplane. It's actually, uh, you know, cloth, cloth covered flight control surfaces. Uh, and it's, it, yeah. It, Wait a minute. Did you say there's no technology. autopilot? No mm -hmm. autopilot. <laughs> Your hand flying wherever work, you go. Okay, okay we'll get to the cock we'll get to the cockpit in a minute, but okay. So so you've got turnbuckles that you're basically what, counting the number of turns to make sure you have the same number, same tension on when you let go, or they're quick disconnect. They're just oh. we just we stick a uh, a tool in, in in the quick disconnect and pop them free. Oh so. perfect. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it is it's it's absolutely amazing. I wanna go to a couple other things to uh um to show here. I love this this one. When you talk about what this thing can swallow, how about uh, taking a formation of T thirty eight talons with you, but saving on fuel <laughs> by taking them inside? What's the story on this one? Go ahead, Ray. I think those were uh, airplanes that were uh, uh, being S excess. I guess is the way to say it. Uh, our fleet, our T-38 fleet has gone down in size as the astronaut office has gone down in size. Mm -hmm. So we had some airplanes that we didn't need anymore, and we were taking them to uh, Davis-Monthan Air Force Base uh, mm -hmm. to be put in the boneyard. And, uh, yeah, you can put two T-38s uh, in the guppy and fly it somewhere. We've actually done it with Air Force T-38s, too, um, picked them up and, and brought them to different repair bases. And it's and That is – that's – Crazy cool. Now you you talk about how to secure a cargo. Obviously, you can secure the bottom. How do you secure something when you stick a load like this into the aircraft of two aircraft nose to tail? A lot of chains. <laughs> you can you can see them all there. It's a lot of chains. Yeah. Are they mainly secured to the bottom, or do you also secure around the perimeter when you load in? Uh, there, there, uh, there's all the, there are all the uh, uh, jack pads and all that they're tied off to. Um, we, we throw straps around the wheels. The, the, the white uh, structure that you see below those is, is designed by our, our engineering branch at AOD. Um, they designed that specifically to move T38s, and um, so, but those, the, the main gear sits on those, and the nose gear sits on those. It's it such a way they're basically uh, kind of askew, you know, like this basically in the plane, in the guppy. But there's, there's straps thrown over the tires and just chains on every tie down point we can find. That's, that's amazing. There's another uh, image that shows what it's really like on the inside. And, and um, tell me a little bit about, you know, what the, you know, what the inside's really, really like when it comes to loading. It looks like it's, it obviously it gets a lot wider the higher it goes. Yeah, and I don't know if Dave, uh, you know, it's hard to see from that other picture, but when we actually strap the airplanes to 
uh, the dunnage, the part that actually goes in the airplane. It actually goes into those rollers that you see on the sides of the floor right there. So it actually mm -hmm. roll in, and then they can actually use hydraulic pins to hold it to the airplane floor. But yeah, you're exactly right. The uh, fuselage gets bigger as you go higher. So if you have a large um, diameter payload, you need to get it up to the fat part of the fuselage. You see how the the T thirty eight wings, even though we took the wing tips off, it's still fairly high up in the inside of the airplane. Um, one thing that is interesting about this airplane is, like any airplane, it has a longitudinal center of gravity, and the, the load masters work very hard to make sure that it's exactly where it needs to be inside the airplane. But it also has a vertical center of gravity. And if we have a large load, a heavy load that's up high in the fuselage, we're limited to the amount of angular bank we can actually turn. We can only go to 20 degrees angular bank. Uh, you know, think of it as a big bowling ball above the fuselage, and as you bank, it just wants to increase that bank. It's destabilizing to the turn. Uh, unlike a lot of you know, high wing airplanes where if you have a load below the wings, it makes it stabilizing, right? This is totally opposite. And uh, so we have to be very careful with that too. And there's a lot of engineering hours and a lot of work by the load master and, and Dave uh, to make sure the load is not only strapped down properly, but in the right place in the airplane to make sure it flies properly. Yeah, you've got those kind of competing, uh, you know, priorities or challenges where on one area you've got the largest cross section up high, so there's so much more room up there. But then, as you said, that causes problems by carrying this 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 weight so far above the aircraft. It, would it be unrecoverable uh, in in certain situations because of that? Yeah, I want to say I read a uh, flight test report that said. Uh, if you're above a certain uh, center of gravity and you get to a certain angle of bank, even a full control deflection in the other direction, it takes approximately 90 seconds to go back to wings level. Uh, so anything past that, you know, steeper angle of bank or, or anything like that, yeah, it would be uncontrollable. You could only do it once. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Is there a simulator for this aircraft? Oh, no. <laughs> no, no super guppy simulator <laughs> that'd be helpful <laughs> now we use the uh, we use the p3 simulator for uh for our emergency procedures for engines and props that's that's the best we got wow that is uh that's that's pretty wild um i want to show when when we talk about its capabilities uh I don't think, and, and you think about the age of the aircraft, a lot of people don't really, I think it's hard to internalize. When you look at the size of a truck or a C-130 here, in the same circle, a C-5 got something that doesn't fit in a galaxy and is just so dwarfed. The guppy's got so much extra space, it looks like you could carry two or three uh, of that yeah. same volume in there. That's, yeah. that's amazing to me. Especially the, since uh, the original, like you said, the original design was thinking of Saturn V rocket stages. Exactly. And, you know, that, that was the basic design. And since then, this particular model of the Guppy, all the parts of the space station that are now in orbit that were built in the United States actually traveled by Guppy to Kennedy Space Center for launch on the shuttles. So, yeah, they were, they were specially built aircraft uh, to do this kind of work. Is it... Is it cool to 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 get the opportunity to be up close and personal with so many spacecraft that you wind up transporting through the years? I think so. I I'm a kid of the '60s, so you know, watching Apollo 11 land on the moon and and the first walk on the moon, I remember that. I I stayed up late and watched that. So to me, this is really the closest thing to being an astronaut, I think, that you can do to be around these type of vehicles and, and move them around the United States and support a human spaceflight. Uh, you know, we've actually moved quite a bit of space hardware over the years and uh, all the way up to the Artemis program now. We're starting to, we've been moving Artemis uh, parts for the last, I don't know, five or six years easily. Yep, that's one of them right there. This, uh, I believe, is a unique story that that uh, of of challenges that I had heard about um, 
about moving Artemis parts. Can uh, Dave, can you talk a little bit about the kind of capabilities, weight versus volume, and some sure. of the challenges that you have having to do with something yeah. like this? Yeah, so that that is Artemis One Crew and Service Module, or CSM. And uh, prior to launching that vehicle, uh, where, as you know, it, 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 it's a maiden launch, it went around the moon, uh, but prior to launch, uh, there was a lot of testing that needed to be done. And uh, some of that testing was done uh, up at uh, Plumbrook, which is now, I believe, Armstrong uh, facility. It's got a new name, but it's up in Ohio. Uh, so we had to fly that from uh, Florida all the way up to Ohio. Um, that is about 48,000 pounds, which is the heaviest thing we've ever flown on the Super W. And, you know, compared to a C5 or a C17, that's, you know, maybe not as much weight, but for us, it, it's it's a lot. Our, our maximum uh, takeoff weight is about 170 pounds, 170,000 pounds, and the aircraft itself weighs about 105,000 with the crew on board. So we had very little room for fuel. So we essentially had about an hour and 15 minutes worth of usable fuel to go from runway to runway and, and essentially just, you know, hopscotch up from Florida to Ohio. And uh, there was a, we had a chase aircraft C-130 that had their technicians on board and our technicians, we had minimum crew on the aircraft, uh, you know, to get there. And we, we pretty much light loaded everything we could. We took all the bags off and, and it got rid of as much weight as we could because every bit of weight that we took off was a little bit extra fuel just in case something went wrong and we needed to, to uh, divert. Uh, and uh, yeah, Ray and I were on that and, and uh, it was it was quite the adventure. It was it was uh, an exciting day. So and I, I assume you can't fuel uh, from you can't tanker this. No, we we were stopping to fuel. Yeah, we were stopping to get fuel, you know, all along the way. So that was the Artemis Super Guppy tour that, like, a, yeah. many <laughs> airports got got a visit from you yeah. as you went along the way with a bunch of cycles <laughs> up right. and down. That's wild. Now, in addition to that, so Ray, you're you're not just talking about forty five thousand pounds. Um, this is not an inexpensive piece of equipment that you were flying. And by the way, no, I never uh, even knew course. that a space capsule was 45,000 pounds. Yeah. But yeah, I was the uh, lucky person who had to sign for it. You know, within the government, whenever there's a, an asset, somebody has to own it essentially or be uh, responsible for it. And while I was in the airplane, it was me. And so the gentleman brought over the paperwork, you know, and I've done this before with other assets that we've moved but uh he brought me the paperwork and i'm looking at it and i noticed the price of this was 2.1 billion with a b dollars <laughs> so for for one day i was worth 2.1 billion dollars uh is what i like to tell my friends yeah. <laughs> certainly your uh your risk level was at 2.1 billion dollars <laughs> I tell you, there were some managers uh, within the agency that were really sweating this flight because uh, this testing had to be done. They had considered multiple ways to do it, and they they found the guppy to be the most reliable and lowest risk. But when I say lowest, that doesn't mean no risk. You know, there's always weather, there's always airplane issues that you got to worry about, and uh, there were a lot of people that were pretty tense that day. Um, you know, the, the one story that we like to tell, too, is we had stopped at uh, Fort Campbell, Kentucky to get some gas. And uh, that was going to be the last leg from Fort Campbell to uh, Mansfield, Ohio. And after Mansfield, they would truck it to the uh, Plumbrook station to do the vacuum and environmental testing. And while at Fort Campbell, I'm reviewing the winds at Mansfield, and they're right at the limit, you know, right at the super guppy limit. And I'm thinking, OK. Uh, the ceilings weren't weren't great. They were probably about 1,500 feet, but uh, the, the winds were right at the limit. I was like, okay, I'm going to look at the trend, and the trend was showing decreasing winds. So we thought, okay, well, we'll we'll sit here. We're safe right now, and then we'll continue on. Well, that hour that we sat there, I must have gotten 20 calls from different managers. Hey, what's going on? When are you going to get here? There are people waiting for you. I was like, yes, I know all that. Thank you very much. 
But, you know, our job was to get it there safely. And that, that was, you know, aircraft commander's prerogative to uh, modify the mission to do that exact thing, be there at when we're safe to do it. And yeah, uh, that, we were that, able to get yeah. up there and land and, and, you know, the rest is history. Yeah. I was going to say that, that you didn't have a spare $2 billion in your pocket in case something went wrong. Yeah. <laughs> you have to go through a lot of couches to find that much money. Yeah. <laughs> when you think of something that's up to 25 feet in diameter, mm -hmm. how do you handle the rest of the journey? What, how does the last, we was talking aviation about the last mile. How does that happen? with something that big is everywhere that you travel to with large cargo, the airport's the final destination or how do you, how do you, how's that handled? No, mostly they, they usually put it on a truck and they have to move it to a facility. Um, sometimes it's, you know, in, in the case of like Kennedy space center, when we deliver there, it's, it's on property. So it's, it doesn't have right. to go very far. It's a controlled environment, but certainly in the case of the CSM, they had to move it, I don't know. I can't remember how many miles, but uh, Ray, you probably know. But it was uh, the amount of effort that it took just to move it over the road. That small amount was astronomical. I mean, they had to cut down trees, they had to remove signs, they had to, you know, take down stoplights. They had to, you know, have a huge escort. And you know, um, they have in the past put put some of these things, not not that one, but you know, other like heat shields, things like that, have gone by truck. And um, there's always the the chance that someone's gonna run into you. You know, you're you're uh, gonna get stuck in traffic for a while. Um, lots of things can happen, and they have. They, things have been stuck for for you know weeks in the past. So um, it was a big deal getting it getting that over the road. Uh, and uh, yeah, we they they typically that's a, a big part of it as well. Is is they have to have cranes on site when we get there, so they can take it off of our our pallet and put it on a truck and, and then they have a big escort that rolls it out. That's, I mean, that's, that's pretty, pretty amazing when you think of some of the challenges associated with moving, moving something of that size. Um, here's think of it this way, you know, you can't go on a highway and just drive down the highway, right? Because of the overpasses and most right, overpasses exactly. are 12 <laughs> feet. So, I mean, they had a, a route, they must have worked on that route for five or six years to get it in shape and ready to go. And it was, I saw pictures later on, it was really neat to see because you rolled this spacecraft through towns that never had that kind of stuff happen before. These were small towns in Ohio. People were out by the road waving American flags. You know, school children were out there. It was pretty cool to watch. Yeah. Um, and I'm sure it was probably one of the biggest events in central Ohio in a long time. So it was, it was neat. Yeah. Just uh, to give you an idea of the, the level of planning that went through it, you know, it, it took, I don't know, seven or eight years. We talked to these guys and, and, and early on when, when I was talking to them, I thought it was never going to happen. I really didn't expect that was something we would do. Um, I just thought cooler heads would prevail and they'd figure out a way to do the testing at KSC. But um, during that time, they actually discussed building a runway at, at the Plumbrook facility. Um, I guess there used to be some small runway, but it was all completely, you know, uh, forested over and everything. And they, they actually considered building a runway just to do this so they wouldn't have to clear all the roads. And they also talked about landing on a highway uh, for us and, you know, that was closer to where it needed to go. So it would, would save them less, you know, time and money and, and hassle getting it to the facility. So uh yeah it was a it was a big effort that's that is wild very very cool um how many or, or types of shows do you do that are similar to how we met and and the opportunities that are just to kind of show off the aircraft that nasa has for special purposes like this i think in general we go with the guppy maybe once a year maybe a little less than once a year if that makes sense um We've certainly been to uh, Dayton. We've been to uh, Barksdale Air Force Base. I think Dave went to Andrews one year, um, or at least the airplane did. Uh, this was our first uh, air venture. We tried to go a few years ago and had a problem before we took off, so we couldn't make it. Uh, we always 
try to attend the Houston Wings Over Houston Air Show because that's our home airport. And uh, if the guppy's available, we'll bring it there. But that, you know, there's a lot of competing uh, missions for the airplane. So schedule is very important and also just maintenance, making sure we get the maintenance done. And if we have things line up and we try to get to a show when we can, because people need to see these kind of airplanes. These are, you know, you shouldn't just see pictures of it. You should see it up close. We let people walk around. We open the nose uh, like we did at AirVenture so people can go up and see inside of it. I mean, it's just an amazing vehicle. Yeah. Yeah, it is. It is truly, truly something very special to see in, in person. Um, from a maintenance perspective, Dave, tell me a little bit about kind of like, you know, the engines and the systems and what what it's like to to have a or and to maintain and operate an aircraft that's not yeah. new, not not no. new. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Well, again, in, in a lot of ways, it's a, it's a very simple airplane. Um, you know, it, it was built at the tail end of World War II, essentially, and most of the technology is, is that old. So parts are very difficult to find. But you know, I I, I don't know if any other organization could do what we do. We, we've got our own engineering department that is able to, you know, uh, essentially reverse engineer some of this stuff and, and come up with, with alternatives. Um, we've done a lot of upgrades to the, to the plane. As a matter of fact, right now it's going through a big ICS upgrade, uh, you know, the inter intercom system for the plane. Um, we're putting in a, a new one um, and, and, you know, it's had the same thing since it was built. So it's, it's a very old system. Uh, but, you know, we, we are always looking for different ways that we can we can upgrade the plane. And, and one of the best things that, to me about working where we do is if we have an idea of something that would make the plane safer and easier to operate, uh, we can bring it up. You know, anybody can come up with these ideas. And, and if they make sense and we can do them, we'll do them. And we, we've actually had some really, you know, uh, worthwhile upgrades on this plane that, that have kept her flying and um, the maintenance team is super busy on it it's it's only a four-man team and they stay pretty much busy anytime the plane's not flying they're they're doing something on it so it, it does require you know a lot of a lot of maintenance i i love this still got fabric on it too yeah yeah that's that's pretty wild i have uh, an, an image of the that i think very few people really get to look at um talk about not not really modern this is this is really classic um yeah. ray take me through the cockpit for from a pilot's perspective yeah i like to tell people this is the best 1950s technology you'll ever see um <laughs> i've actually seen videos from the early 60s of of a this airplane was actually built from a KC-97, which was a tanker derivative of that Boeing 377 I had talked about. But I've seen videos from the early 60s and the cockpit looks exactly the same. We have done a couple of upgrades. We added a flight management system. Uh, we added some electronic displays. Uh, but really from a pilot standpoint, you know, the person who's flying is only flying because there are no boost to flight controls. It's all muscle power. Um, there's no autopilot, so you're you're doing it all. The person not flying is working the radios and working the navigation. But really, the king of the cockpit is Dave as a flight engineer, and this is what he sees. And if you notice, and he can go through this more uh, explicitly than I can, but from a, a dumb pilot point of view, the four white knobs right there in the lower center section are the throttles. And we tell him, hey, Dave, we need torque, whatever. We give him a setting, and he sets it. Uh, if there's a problem where they have to shut an engine down, those little handles to the right with the red uh, caps on them, that, those shut the engines down. And out of view to the right are all the systems and all the gauges. And, and the few gauges you see in the front on the main uh, instrument panel uh, don't completely tell the story of the airplane. So I'm going to throw it to Dave because he can tell you more about systems than I mean, yeah. he waters my eyes sometimes, you know, hey, there's this motor yeah. that has a little pin that has eight volts on it. And if it only gets four volts, it does this. And if it gets 12 volts, it does. And I'm like, how do you know all this stuff? Uh, but, he, he's, uh, being, he's being generous. <laughs> I, they got no, the important, you, they got a the good important. point. I was just about to get to you, Dave, with that, because this picture is from your seat. And right. you're, you know, it's hard. I think it's hard for people to relate to the, the, some of the who haven't flown an aircraft flight engineers that you're the one with the throttles. 
-hmm. Right. Well, you notice the, the pilots do have throttles up between them, but it, they're very awkward. They're almost, they're almost behind them at, at some times. And, and when we say this aircraft is a handful, it, it really is. Um, you know, from I think every, you know, all of our perspective, it's like the pilot has the tough job of getting the thing on the ground. You know, we, we are there to, you know, to, to take everything else off of their plate so they can just concentrate on that. Uh, it, it, it is certainly a bear to do that. Uh, but yeah, we, we, you know, uh, we're voice activated auto throttle pretty much. They, they call it and we set it and we, we, bring, we handle the, the throttle from takeoff to land. Uh, and just, you know, they need, you know, we, we, we kind of train to respond to the immediacy in their voice too. You know, I know Ray can, can attest to that, that, that it's, you know, uh, Sometimes, you know, as you know, as a pilot coming in, sometimes you need, you need power right now, right? And, uh, and we can hear that urgency in their voice sometimes and make sure that we're right there with them uh, throughout the landing. And, and it is something that takes time to develop that, uh, that crew resource management that we have as a team. Uh, you know, it is very important to us uh, because uh, I, I'm handling all those things for them, you know, and they're calling it out and we need to make sure that we're communicating well uh, to ensure that we get the plane on the ground safely. Is it a complex uh, fuel system also to manage? Yes and no. I'll, I'll tell you the scare, one of the, one of the scariest parts about, about it is going on cross feeding. So we typically, when we get, we normally put about 2000 or 2000 pounds more fuel in the outboard tanks. We got the tanks one through four and then some in the center that we barely use the center tank. Uh, but we'll put about 2,000 pounds more in the, in the outboard tanks. And then as we get down to about 3,000 pounds in the center, we'll go on cross feed. Well, it's a, it's a wafer switch that we're turning that moves a valve out on the wing during the flap well uh, to, you know, basically we tell it what to do and it does it out there. And we have a little light that is a synchronization light and it tells us, whether the valve is is where the switch is. So as soon as we turn that switch, the light comes on. And you give about a two to three potato, you're, you're counting as that thing and hoping it's gonna go out, that the, that the valve moved uh, all the way. And and we have been on a flight where uh, we had a valve that was acting up and it didn't go. It got about halfway and got stuck and shut off fuel on the, <laughs> on the engine. We had to shut it down. And thankfully, we were able to mess around with the switch and get it back again, but Every time we do the cross feeding, it's kind of funny because it's it's like a general announcement. Okay, I'm going on cross feeding, and everybody turns around and looks to make sure it's going to be okay. But yeah, it, it's not a, a super complex system, honestly. You know, we we kind of set it, forget it most of the time. Um, but yeah, that's probably the hardest thing about it. Wow, and and it sounds ripe for your engineering team to maybe find a different solution. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I've had that happen once in you know 13 years. Again, it's it's not a it's not a common occurrence, uh, and, and uh, yeah, it got our attention for sure. But we we know to watch for it, and and you know we test them on the ground prior to flight, each and every flight, for just that reason to make sure that they're working. It is are the engines responsive? I mean, obviously, there's big fat propellers out there yeah. for you. Yeah, for sure. You know, I mean, that's the thing about turbo turbo props is their instant power. So you know, that's why they were used on, on the P3 and the C-130, you know, they were really good at the jobs that they did because you can, you can put on a bunch of power and you get it, you get it instantly rather than having that spool up of a, of a jet engine. Yeah. Ray, tell me a little bit about what, it, what it's like. I mean, when you do uh, have to go engine out or something, Dave mentioned at least one case, the engine went out. Um, what's, what's the capabilities of this on not all four engines going yeah so before we take off obviously we figure all that out and when dave gives me the uh, card that tells us our takeoff performance our takeoff distance and power settings and everything uh he'll also have three engine and two engine ceilings so in other words if we lose one so we're on three engines that we have a, a max mounted we can get to and usually it's it's clear the terrain where we are in most cases unless we're really heavy but a lot of times two engines out we're just going to the scene of the crash because it doesn't have any capability at that point. And even going around, if we were to be in a cruise mode and lose two engines and then go try to land, 
uh, if we try to go around on that landing, it's it's nearly uncontrollable. Um, so it's it's a handful. Uh, it's a handful with four engines, and it's more of a handful as the engines go offline. And you know, one thing you were talking about air crew coordination. Dave was talking about that. Uh, we like to harass Dave and the flight engineers a little bit because they have all the gauges and lights and everything in the back, and the pilots can't really see it very well. And uh, sometimes they will say words like, oh, that doesn't look good, or so oh, that's not right. <laughs> and, you know, nothing gets your blood pressure up faster and your heartbeat racing is when the flight engineer says, oh, that's not right. And, uh, you know, he might be talking about something he saw on the Internet or whatever, but, uh, you know, it's, it's <laughs> definitely like, OK, what are you talking about? Get me into this conversation here. Yeah, that's that's definitely what 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 are its handling capabilities? You mentioned it's kind of a handful. It is. I mean, you have to think ahead. It you know, no boosted flight controls. Um, you don't really it's not a pinpoint type airplane like a T-38 where you can fly formation with it. It's you're just guiding it to where you want it to go. Sometimes it's in charge and sometimes you're in charge. Um, certainly landings can be a handful. Uh, I've had my share of really bad landings in this airplane and it's pretty humbling uh to do that and you know when the flight engineers start laughing at you then it's you know you got to get your game going a little bit better but uh yeah it's it's you just got to watch it you know it 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 does a great job for what it was designed for but uh you got to know its quirks dave are, are, are flight engineers kind of like the quintessential backseaters in in the military <laughs> where you no, you, we, you're you're the guys with the mafia that that know who the good pilots are and uh <laughs> sure i mean you know i mean honestly it's uh we we don't uh i couldn't do it so i i mean <laughs> you know these guys are great pilots the, the pilots that we have on this are, are, are you know we we pick all the pilots at, at our organization you know because they're the best and um, these guys are real good they know what they're doing but i, I will say that that this airplane humbles every one of them <laughs> at some point it is a very difficult aircraft and uh you know it's i think very difficult to fly in a crosswind definitely difficult to land in a crosswind um, and uh it's not so much fun for my seat either so <laughs> uh no i don't give them a hard time about their landings as long as we get on the ground safe i'm, I'm happy with that i mean you know sometimes we'll we'll count you know more more landings on that one landing you know that, i think that was three <laughs> But is it is it like the cross section of the volume that just makes it so, so much to handle? Yeah, it's got so much side area. I mean, it's 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 uh, compared to the size of the flight controls, uh, the rudder and the elevator and the ailerons, it's got a lot of surface area. So any wind is magnified. Um, crosswind limit is twenty knots. Uh, twenty knots is is a challenge. And what we'll do as a pilot is get on final and if you can hold it on the center line at higher altitude where the winds are higher you can hold it all the way to the ground but the thing is it's like general aviation uh pilots that i've seen i've obviously flown a lot of uh, i'm a cfi so i fly a lot with general aviation pilots and you think when the airplane is on the ground the flight's over it's not in the guppy <laughs> i mean when you the touch down you're dragger yeah, I mean, you are still putting that crosswind control in there and holding it and holding it until you get to a taxi speed. Because, yeah, if you just land and take a deep breath, the airplane is going to start going off in some direction you don't want it to. So you got to be very careful with it. Uh, P factors is magnified with four engines. Um, crosswinds are magnified. Sometimes they cancel out, but a lot of times they don't. They add to each other. And, uh, yeah, it's it's a handful. It's definitely a handful. Wow, and and the center of gravity being up higher, how does that affect things for you too? Yeah, to me, it's just more of an awareness that you can't really go to a normal angle of bank, you know, in a normal airplane. I, I'm okay going to 30 degrees pretty regularly, but in this airplane, I think all of us kind of fly at 20 degrees angle of bank whenever we make a turn, just because you want to have that kind of sense of respect to the airplane, whether you have a high center of gravity or not, and just fly it. Uh, so that you're not going to challenge it in a sense, you know, so everybody just kind of does the same thing. It's just easier. So is it like a crab coming in or slip? What's the, what's the trick with the, 
with the guppy? I usually well, I'll I'll crab a little bit, but typically I will do a uh, a slip. So I'll put wing down into the wind, and then a little bit of opposite rudder. But with this airplane, if you look at the rudder, it's really tiny compared to the size of the airplane. So what you think the right amount of rudder is is probably about a third of what you really uh, need. So you know, it's it's much more input than you would think. It's all tiny compared to what the elevator is tiny compared to it. <laughs> Where does this picture come in? Obviously, you've got a chase plane. Do you know what this one happens to be? Oh, yeah. Yeah, that, that's, that's, uh, that's, that's Clay Lacey right there. Oh. That was on, that was on our way up to, uh, uh, Boeing, to the Boeing uh, Air and Space Museum up there in Seattle. We were taking the shuttle, uh, one of the shuttle trainers up there. And um, we actually met Clay Lacey, and he flew on our wing and took a bunch of video of us coming in and pictures. That is and so, just, so cool. Just to add to that, you know, Clay Lacey was one of the original test pilots on the first gun. He was oh, friends really? with Jack Conroy, yeah. And they were in the same Air National Guard unit. And, uh, yeah, so he has a lot of guppy interest. In fact, he was at Air Oshkosh Air Venture this yeah. year, and he came out and saw the airplane. Wow. Now. You guys have a, a quite a few cool, we mentioned a, a, a few unique aircraft that are in the stable there in addition to the Guppy. And I, I want to make sure I, I also give a chance to, to see some of these things. You actually fly this uh, WB-57. Uh, Ray, tell me a little bit about this. So the WB-57 is a high altitude aircraft. It can go uh, above 60,000 feet. Uh, currently, we use it primarily for imaging spacecraft, either coming back into the atmosphere uh, through parachute deployment and then touchdown, or actually some rockets that are being launched. We could uh, we have a large 10-inch telescope that we can put on the nose of the airplane, and then uh, we can take imagery like that. We also use it for airborne science. Uh, I flew it one time. It had 26 different experiments on it, and we were flying air... Uh, uh, airborne science mission, so sampling air around Colorado, in fact. Um, so we were up at 60,000 plus and uh, doing air samples. Do you, when you're flying at that, that type of an altitude, do you, do you still regular gear that you're wearing? I mean, that's, you're getting- No, we, uh, we have to wear pressure suits above 50,000 feet. So we'll, we'll wear normal flight suits up to 50,000 feet. Anything above that, we have to put a pressure suit on. Um, which only adds to the misery of <laughs> flying the airplane sometimes because of just the it gets uncomfortable after a while. Is there a helmet that goes with a pressure suit, or is it just? Yeah, we wear the same pressure suit that a U two pilot would wear. It's the exact same color and helmet and everything else. Our gear actually goes through uh, Beale Air Force Base for overhaul. Wow, that is very very cool. Okay, I have to end on my uh, favorite guppy picture which uh, just happens to be this one. <laughs> <laughs> nice. We had some pictures taken last, what is it? I guess that was in the spring uh, yeah. of all the pilots and, and flight engineers and everybody else, maintenance guys. And and uh, I think I harassed Dave. I said, go out there and just do a funny picture. And he did that, and they took a picture of it. So there you go. <laughs> <laughs> well, Dave, that, that is now memorialized on uh, Social Flight Live, the uh, recording that'll be out there for YouTube for everyone to see. So um, <laughs> it's uh, it, it's it's out there for for everyone. <laughs> nice. Well, uh, uh, Ray and Dave, thank you so so much for taking time out of your evening to join us here on Social Flight Live. And um, where are you going to be next? Where is the next thing that you know about? If anyone happens to be around, they can see the Super Guppy. Ooh, let's see. I think the next secret. Yeah, I think the next. No, I think the next thing. Um, so we we pick up a lot of heat shields. Uh, that's one of our our big recurring jobs, and, and we fly up to. Um, nowadays we're flying to Pueblo, Colorado. We used to fly into Aurora to Buckley Airfield, which um, you, you know nobody else has really access to that. It, it's pretty tightly controlled, but. But uh, Pueblo is just the, the normal airfield there. We get we get all sorts of people out there looking at the aircraft when we come up there. But we'll take heat shields from there um, that are either going out to an autoclave to be finished uh, on the west coast, or we'll take them to, to KSC where they'll they'll put them on a on a crew module. So I think we're doing that uh, sometime 
February, I believe. I'm not sure. Yeah. All right. Well, sure. For anyone who's out near Pueblo, somewhere in February, <laughs> keep an eye yep. out. There you go. And we are talking about going to Sun and Fun this year, if the schedule allows. We might see some people at Sun and Fun. Oh, that would be amazing. I will be down there as well, and that would be great to see both of you down there and have more people get to see this amazing aircraft and get to meet you guys. Yeah, come on by. Absolutely. Well, thank you so much, Ray Heineman and Dave Elliott of the Super Guppy and uh, from NASA. I am grateful that you both came on Social Flight Live and shared the story, your stories as well as the story of this amazing aircraft. And, and I hope you, we do get to see you at Sun and Fun. So thank you so much. Yes, sir. Happy to do it. Thank you. Have a great evening, guys. Take care. Bye. Yeah. And to all of you, thank you so much for everything that you do to support General Aviation and for joining us here on Social Flight Live. We'll be back next Tuesday, that is November 28th, where we are going to hear about flying the B-2 Stealth Bomber with B-2 pilot Keith Reeves. This will be truly an amazing show, and you don't hear much about this aircraft, and uh, we will coax what we legally can out of Keith about what it's like to fly that amazing aircraft. And then on Tuesday, December 5th, the amazing Dick Rutan will be back here on Social Flight Live talking about his stories from Vietnam and after during the Cold War, some truly spectacular stories, an inside scoop from one of our nation's top war heroes and, and an amazing pilot. Um, in his uh, that is documented in his book, The Next Five Minutes. So I hope you join us for those shows. And until next time, I'm Jeff Simon for Social Flight, and I wish you all blue skies.